Boom. See, I wanted to beat you to the party this time, brother. Oh, yeah, you sure did. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening, bro? Oh, uh, you know, just chilling after a Thanksgiving weekend. Did you put your fat pants on Thursday and Friday? Um, You know, I ate, I had a turkey dinner Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We had one here. <laughs> I visited my mom, had one with my mom, had one with my brother. Damn. Lots awesome. of turkey. Lots, Lots of turkey. Of turkey. Hey, let's hear it for our, our sponsors, Full Spectrum CBD. We love you guys over there. Uh, Jody Gentry with Media Jaws back with us. Glad to have you back, Jody. And Alexandria over at Backbeat Music. You'll see all their logos and stuff behind me here shortly. But I, I don't, dude, we're not going to prep this at all, man. We got Brian Ray in the waiting room. Yeah. Epic. Brian Ray, Etta James, Sir Paul McCartney. This dude's catalog. A Beatle. Is- um, you know, I mean, come on. He's playing with the Beatle. He's playing with the Beatle. A I Beatle? Say like that time. He's All right, so let's just bring him in, brother. What do you say? I say I concur. I concur. All right, let's I see concur. <laughs> hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Look at you, brother. What's going on, buddy? How you doing? I'm hanging out, man, you know, just hanging during the apocalypse like any of us, trying right. to keep together, trying to be kind, doing my thing, all in good time. There you go, bud. There you go. What about you? What about you? About the same thing, shooting zombies, you know, trying to get through the apocalypse here, brain eaters and all that fun stuff. Get them. Fucking get them. <laughs> right? Right? I think Robbie up there, he's gotten, he's bagged a few of them. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't been bit yet. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's what she said. Because once is too many. You know, just right. one bite and you're messed up, man. You're done. You're done. So you're done. you you still out there on the West Coast, Brian? I am. I'm in Santa Monica, California, right here at uh, my house. Cool. And, um, where are you coming from? So I'm in West Texas myself. And I'm in Orange County. I'm I'm in uh, okay. Santa Ana, North Tustin. All right. I know it well. Know it well. Well, it's yeah. good with you guys, man. Absolutely, my brother. You too. So we've got so much to go over. Oh, so wow. much of the catalog, so much of the history. Brother, you have been one blessed human being in, in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm going to take it all the way back to growing up in California, born in 1955, growing up in Southern Cali. Do that. That's that's like picturesque, you know, what we all thought of a Cali, the Beach Boys music and all that fun stuff. Let, let's talk about that vibe in Cali back then. Yeah, well, you know, when I was a little kid, man, I was like, um, you know, I was curious and ready for something. I, I wanted out already. I was wanted to do something to shake it up. And when um, 
I was about three or four years old. I tell this story all the time. It's just my story. You know, I had this half sister who was 15 years older than me. And when she was babysitting me for this one year, she lived with our family. She would take me over to her girlfriend's house and they'd play me like little Richard, Elvis Presley. Here come the Everly brothers. Uh Oh, there's Rick Nelson too. Right. And I'm a little four-year-old, three-year-old kid just taking it in and watching these girls like react to this, this new phenomenon, rock and roll. And it was everything at once. It was like a visceral thing. It was like the pictures. They showed me the pictures. Here comes the music, then their response to it. And as, way too young to be digging on rock and roll and seeing what it was doing to people, but I got it all. And <clears throat> weirdest thing is, like I knew right then that was my calling. I didn't know how or why, but you know, it was just weird. And then, you know, as sort of guitar rock came in uh, soon after that, you had people like Scotty Moore with Elvis. Then you had yes. Dwayne Eddy with those great guitar things and Link Ray and Rumble and, uh, you know, Roust about all these great early instrumental records. And then that fed into, you know, early surf music. And that fed into Motown. And then here come the Beatles and like, uh-oh, everybody's in. And, you know, it was just a wild ride, you know? Absolutely. Wow. You talk about Scotty Moore. It used to make me laugh watching Elvis, you know, up and on those movies. And he'd be jamming and it'd be Scotty Moore behind him doing the actual chords, you know. It was, it was an incredible time to, to be alive back then. I, I couldn't imagine what Southern California was just on fire back then. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a great place for music back then. I mean, you know, if you see something like American Graffiti, I'm not sure where they were picturing that being shot, but it was about that time, you know, you know, uh, those sort of curbside and, and car side restaurants, you know, that's that's what I was raised around. You know, I'm that old. You know, I, I was there. A <laughs> girl skated up to our car and gave me a burger, man. I'm that old. Wow. That's badass, brother. <laughs> Are you talking about your, is that Jean you're talking about? That's right. That's my late sister, my half-sister, uh. Jean Ray. That's right. And she was my uh, mentor and my inspiration. She went on to have a great folk rock career with her husband, Jim, and they were Jim and Jean. And they were on Verve Folkways and um, Verve for Forecast Records. They did about three or four albums and... Uh, you know, man, I was just like taking it all in. So yeah, before Motown came in, I was already into the folk too. So right. I was kind of getting it all, you know, as a little kid, I was a sponge for it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. So I mean, you, cause I had seen that you played at the Troubadour with them. And in that time, I mean, wow. That's before like, you know, the era, most of the people we talked to from my era or whatever, playing the Troubadour through the eighties and stuff. I mean, we are talking about, you know, the whole different thing. I mean, it's, with its heyday, really, you know, when it's- Yeah, yeah, exactly. The earlier days of what the Troubadour started as yeah. was a, uh, a beat club, meaning beatniks and folkers and uh, protest music. So it was all tables, all seated with those little red candles with the net on them. I remember it, I can remember it like it was yesterday. And yeah, I played, my first gig was there at a hoot night which was short for Hootenanny. And every Monday okay. night, right. these pokers and country people would come out and do their thing. And Jean had now left Jim and Jean, they had divorced. And she had me come up and play, you know, at a hoot night for her original material when I was 15 years old in 1970. Wow. So it's, that's quite a while ago, you're right. Wow. So you picked up a guitar around the age of nine, is that correct? That's right. And uh, Jean gave me my first guitar. She and her husband, Jim, picked up like a $5 nylon string guitar going over the border in Tijuana. And they gave it to me and I started crying. It was just like, oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> I, I, you know, it was not a Gibson or a Guild or a Gretsch or a Fender. It was like, right. eh, eh, you know, some dude made it in a half hour in Tijuana. But man, I love that thing like nothing else. You still have it. <laughs> wish, dude. I wish I still had it. I loaned it to a girl that I was kind of hot for. And that was, you know, that was all she wrote. Right. She never came to see me and never brought my, my guitar back. 
<laughs> no. I'm sure she's regretted that day for a long time, brother. I wonder that. I got to look her up. She was the granddaughter of the man who played Alfred on the Batman TV series. Oh, wow. Really? We were just talking about Batman <laughs> just, <laughs> just a few minutes ago. <laughs> the old series. <laughs> oh, man, it was it was so funny. I mean, that show was so great. Yeah, so I, that was my first guitar, and the first song I ever played on it was G-L-O-R-I-A oh. by Van Morrison when he was with them. And really? uh, yeah, I learned it when it came out, about 1964 or so. I learned that song, and I was kind of off to the races. Three chords in a dream, man. Nice. There you go, brother. There you nice. go. So we got to like talk that. about this bizarre story with uh, Kaufman. Uh-oh. Okay, so I, I've done a little bit of research here. Bill Kaufman was a tour manager known for stealing the body of singer Graham Parsons and setting it on fire out in the desert. So somehow you've got a link to this with playing with Bobby Pickett and the Monster Mash at a benefit for this guy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, it sounds a lot worse when you say it that way. Yes, he did steal a body, but in his defense, he was Graham Parsons' best friend. Okay. Uh, he was his personal, you know, his personal assistant. Right. And uh, he was a road manager for the Flying Burrito Brothers, the country rock psychedelia band uh, that came out of the birds, the West Coast birds. Uh, Phil Kaufman was a ne'er-do-well cowboy, you know, Korean War vet, Hell's Angel, wow. Harley riding maniac with a handlebar mustache and a fucking attitude. Right. And he's still with us. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Anyway, yeah, I had never met him, never even heard of him. But I was playing with this guy, Bobby Boris Pickett and the, and the Crip Kicker Five. Yeah. And I was 17 years old playing like Six Flag over Texas or whatever, Fort Worth. And, uh, you know, playing the Monster Mash. The Monster with Bobby Mash. Bobby Pickett. They did the mash. <laughs> the, the Monster, Monster Mash. mash. <laughs> and that was my first professional tour gig. Uh, and, right. Uh, I got a call and Gene was the background singer in that band. And the band for Bobby Boris Pickett was my high school band, basically. Oh, wow. He, he, you know, it was a heist. He took my high school band. He was now the lead singer. And we all did like zombie makeup, talking of zombies again. Right. We did our own zombie makeup and we'd play the mash. And we had about a 40 minute show and it was fun and funny. And I got a call that we were going to play a gig for this guy named Graham, pa I mean, this guy named Phil Kaufman out in the San Fernando Valley near Burbank area. And I went, okay, great. It's a daytime gig, you know, a couple hours, whatever. We get there and it's this wild sort of ranch house looking place, this big long porch in the front built in maybe the, you know, 1910 or something like that. And he had like, giant neon eagles like you remember the uh aa eagles from the a uh, american gas company there were these oh. giant neon steel sign eagles in the front and all this crazy stuff and mannequins all around and i go what the hell kind of dreamscape did we just get into we set up in the back there's other bands there's going to be dr demento he was a cool dj Yep. Uh, the Modern Lovers and a few other acts were on the bill and about 200 people. I go, okay, this is chill. You know, we did our monster. I put on my makeup. We did our, our monster music. And then I'm introduced to Phil. And for some reason, he kind of took a shine to me. Well, we found out that we were there to play a fundraiser to pay off his legal fees <laughs> for having to defend himself against stealing a casket. Oh, wow. With Graham Parsons in it. Right. But that's all they could get him in. They didn't have any crip kicking in the, in the books. <laughs> but it's so weird. Here I am playing his fundraiser in a band called the Crip Kicker Five. <laughs> well, wow. he had done, you know, there's this whole book on it. There's a movie on it. He's quite the character. 
Uh, that's that was my first. Uh, that was my break. Phil Kaufman then took me in and said, "I'm also road managing Etta James. Right. Would you like to come up wow. and uh, jam with Etta James tomorrow?" And I said, "Sure." He says, "Okay, stay out in the guest house, and uh, we'll go up there tomorrow." And uh, sure enough. You know, there I was, 18 years old, little nice. long-haired kid from Glendale, hanging out with Etta, who was fresh out of, like, um, treatment for heroin addiction. So it was right. just a wild uh, period of time. Etta turns to Phil after that jam and says, well, I like that little white kid. And uh, she came up to me and says, would you come and play with me tomorrow night in Long Beach? And I said, hell yeah, are you kidding me? And uh, yeah, that was the beginning of what turned into a 30, 30 year, you know, collaboration and friendship. Yeah. One of the most incredible voices of our lives. No Just doubt about incredible, it. Incredible, incredible talent. Incredible and great, a great performer. If any of your viewers and listeners were lucky enough to see her, especially in those days, in the seventies and eighties, woof. It was something else, man. It was a life-changing situation there. Look how young you look here, brother. I mean, not to say anything bad, but you're you, you look like you're like fresh out of junior high school here. Yeah, I ain't anymore, but yeah, I sure was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I Come stay on, with the lights. I stay where the lights are low now, man. What are you gonna do? <laughs> you gotta surrender to time. That's it, brother. You Just look Southern it. California all the way, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you I still do. <laughs> I was very Southern California, still am. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got a, a question from the audience here, real quick, by Brenda, who actually happens to be my mom. <laughs> she says, I have to ask as a little girl, I would just fall apart every time I heard Etta James. How did you, how did her sound and vibe affect you personally when you first heard her? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And Etta had that effect on everybody, Brenda. It's, um, it was a stunning thing. Like, I had heard of her and I'd heard her records just, you know, on pirate radio coming out of Tijuana over an illegal radio station at night. But when Phil Kaufman said, I'm working with Etta James, would you like to come to the Troubadour where I had just told you I played, uh, right. you know, what, three years earlier, my first ever gig on a stage. And here Etta James, I said, sure. Now Etta was doing a three night stand at the Troubadour. The place was packed. It was insane in there. Greg Allman was in the band. Billy Payne from Little Feet was in the band. Oh. Born sex, it was insane. And Etta had something to prove because she'd been away getting better from a long illness with you know what. Right. So now she had something to prove and she had a career to regain and trust to rebuild. And it, there I am in the audience and I'm like, my jaw was on the ground because it wasn't just me being affected this way. You didn't even have to look around. You just knew everyone was getting their heart expanded, uh, punched in the gut, laughing, crying, just the whole gamut, man. So your mom's right. Um, it's uh, she's a, an unusual, singular performer. Absolutely, absolutely, brother. So you, you spent what fourteen years with Anna? Yeah, about fifteen as a guitar player and band leader, and then another fifteen or more as her sort of collaborator and sometimes producer and. Um, yeah, we worked on film and a TV show, and she worked on my solo album uh, called Mondo Magneto and a song called yeah. Soft Machine. Um, I worked on more of her albums in the later days, but yeah, my first recording with her was in 1976 on an album called Edda is Betta. Yep. And um, that was on Chess Platinum Records. You can still find that now. And then Deep in the Night with, uh, with um, Jerry Wexler producing, who produced Respect and all of Aretha's big hits, all the way till you know, her solo stuff way down into the uh, 90s, yeah. How wonderful, what a beautiful friendship that must have been. 
And you guys shared the stage with some epic, you know, epic bands, Rolling Stones, Van Morris, and John Lee Hooker. I mean, just what a time to be alive and be a musician. You, you, is it true you've never had an outside job of being a musician? Well, I mean, I had a couple of jobs way before finding a way to make a living playing music. I, I uh, was a, 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 gross, a grocery bagger at a grocery store. Okay. And I right. sold daffodils on street corners for a summer. I did some gardening. So I did that kind of stuff, like the stuff that kids do, you know? Right. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. So, Brian, we've got a producer by the name of Jess who wants to come in and ask some questions from the audience, if you're okay with that. Yeah, heck yeah. Come on in. All right. So we're going to bring in the water's fine. <laughs> hey. What's up, Jess? Oh, it's not on. Do you guys see me? Yes. I, see you. Okay, I can't see you guys. The camera's not on. But I can read you the questions. Nice to meet you. I you can too. Fix that Thank you. I need to. Let me and fix where that. are you coming from then, Jess? Where are you at? I am in California. I'm actually Robbie's wife. So I am coming from the living room. <laughs> Let me see where the camera's at. <laughs> this is very Wayne's world right I now. Can't, I can't see where to We're see. We're big yeah, production. We, big, big we don't get a production. camera on my side. Oh, there, there we, we are. Go. <laughs> okay, cool. Cool. Now I can see you much better. Nice to meet you. Okay, so we have a question from Cheryl. Um, she's interested in finding out who was your biggest influence. Wow, that's that's a tough one. Well, I would say again, my my late sister Jean had to be number one, and then Etta James. You know, it's kind of chronological, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and of course the Beatles. You know, but I I was sort of already on the path before the Beatles started. But then, you know, it was the Beatles and the Stones and the Animals and everyone who came in behind the, the Beatles. Right. All of it, you know, all of it. But I would have to, if there's one person, I, I think it would have to be Jean because, you know, she was taking me to, to club gigs in LA when I was 10, 11 years old. Like, oh my God, this is really happening, you know? So maybe, maybe that's the uh, simplest answer. Yeah, that, that's that's what sisters are for, big sisters. <laughs> yeah. And then we had a question from Ron. Um, he wants to know how you met Rusty, or um, did you know him before Paul? Yes, way before Paul. Thanks, Ron. Um, so for a period of time, I lived in a in a little part of LA called Silver Lake, and it's it's been a place through the years that's been filled with artists and hipsters and. Uh, all sorts of cool people out there. It's somewhere between Hollywood and downtown LA, okay? And I lived there with my girlfriend. We had a cool apartment. And I used to play, yeah, I was playing gigs at like club lingerie and stuff like that, a cool club in LA, the Central, before it was the Viper Room. And uh, I think that's where where Rusty and I met or no I went to go see him play at a place and he was in a band with a guy named Parthenon and I just thought he was the coolest guitar player and he he played a green Ibanez like Steve Vai guitar with the handle in it and a green colored amp and he was just shredding you know and kind of tapping on the he was just a really good guitar player well come to find out Rusty lived uh, two blocks away from me in Silver Lake. And we just became like guitar buddies, uh, you know, loaning gear to each other and stuff like that. We never played together, but uh, until Paul. But uh, yeah, we've known each other long before Paul. I must have met him in, oh, I want to say around 88, somewhere in there. Wow, yeah. Can we have one more question from Jennifer? Um, she's interested in finding out how the process was or um, when you were auditioning for Paul McCartney. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a good one. Um, it's kind of a wild story. Uh, wow, the moon is coming up and it's giant. Okay, so back to the question. Um, so 
I had been playing in France for years and the drummer on the French gigs was a guy named Abe Laboreal Jr. When Abe uh, let us know that he wasn't gonna do the next tour after about five years over there, I said, well, what are you doing? What's, what's better than playing stadiums in France and you know hanging out and smoking Cuban cigars? And he said, oh, well, I'm doing Paul McCartney's new album. This was 2001-ish. And I said, whoa, you're kidding me. And uh, he said, yeah. I said, okay, man, I can't wait to hear all about it. So we're at my birthday party a couple months later. I had just uh, tried for Shakira's new gig uh, after playing on her album, Laundry Service. And they hired someone else. And I was like, ah, oh, no. 9-11 it, had just happened. I was like, oh, gee, what am I going to do? And then I had this weird thought. I thought, well, Abe and Rusty are both playing with Paul McCartney. Who knows? Maybe maybe I could whatever, you know. Right. Three months after that thought, three months after 9-11, my birthday, Abe's at my birthday party. And I said, so you're going on tour with Paul or not? What's going on? He goes, yeah, we're, we're going to probably do some shows. And uh, he says, we're going to do the Super Bowl first. And I thought, well, wow. Um, I said, well, who's going to play bass while he plays guitar, but then play guitar while he plays bass or piano or guitar when he plays bass? And he goes, yeah, well, we're looking for a guitar player who plays bass. And I put my hand up and I said, <laughs> okay. I'd love a shot at that. And yeah. he put my name forward to Paul's producer, a guy named David Kahn. Met with David Kahn, just hanging out at his uh, studio. And uh, no one else was there, just David Kahn and I. And talking and playing a little bass, playing a little guitar. And after about 45 minutes of talking and jamming and just goofing off, he said, OK, man, well, there's some other people they're considering, but I have a good feeling about this and I'll put your name for it. We'll see what happens. It's out of my hands now, but thank you very much. So I left and didn't think a whole lot about it, except I hope they'd call. Well, I got a call the next day from Paul's office saying, can you be on a plane tomorrow to come to New Orleans to play one song with Paul on the Super Bowl 2002? And I was like, yeah course you know and so that's right. that's how it started wow that's exciting uh, that's exciting incredible it thanks was. jess thank you thanks jess i mean yeah how, how exciting is that a beetle right i mean an actual beetle it, yeah i mean it's like the top of the food chain it starts there that's true <laughs> yeah absolutely incredible. right so you must Boom. be pinching yourself being like uh, is this really happening <laughs> yeah i was totally pinching myself and still am you know it's like yeah now we're looking at nine years later and I'm still like, oh my God, thank my lucky stars. Like, wow, that actually happened. Right. It's still you happening. 19 years later. 19 yeah. years later. What 19. did I say? You said nine. Oh, so 19. yeah, sorry. It was yeah. supposed to be one gig. Here you are right there. Yeah, that's me all right, yeah. Yeah, look at you guys, man. Rock and roll icons right there. Well, so one gig turns into 19 years. Is it great friendship? I mean, how, how's the vibe between you guys when you're in the studio? Well, yeah, we've done a lot of albums together now. And uh, it's great. I mean, it's, it's Paul McCartney, you know, and he's just, he's got such a fertile mind and he's so active and he's always buzzing and he's always got an idea. And you're just kind of there to be like, say, just a, a little dab of paint on the palette that he might pick up and use or not, you know, because to be honest with you, Matt, he could play any parts on any instrument that he ever hears, except mm -hmm. maybe he doesn't play cello and violin uh, or saxophone, but pretty much everything else. He plays drums, bass, keyboards. You know, he and then he arranges all the other stuff. So you're really just there kind of like on the ride, you know, and he's uh, painting sonic pictures all day long. And you watch this stuff kind of grow and come to life. And 
it's a it's a real privilege to be a part of his orbit. That's cool. And there's something to be said for being around somebody like that. Because even at first, when you're around somebody with that kind of talent, you start picking up on it, even if you're not, you kind of at first go, oh my God, how's he doing this? But the more you're around it, I'm sure you pick up on it just kind of spiritually. And I'm sure it, it comes across like saying your music, your solo records and stuff. It has to, it has to affect it. Well, there's no doubt that Paul and his work as in the Beatles solo and wings were super influential to me. Um, his arrangement mind, his production mind, just everything, uh, and his musicianship, but his writing and his ear for sonic hooks, that does get under your skin, you know? And, um, and I've always loved writing and recording and fancied myself sort of a songwriter and producer way before I had any business calling myself those things. But uh, his influences were, were great on me. And chief among them really is that the way I was hearing music, the way I wanted to hear music that I wanted to make was a little bit expensive. You know, it called for real guys in a real room at the same time in a big room with a great studio console and a fantastic engineer you know and i didn't have the money to be able to do those kinds of things that i heard before paul so that's also a big uh contribution i mean so it's spiritual it's musical it's production but it's also he gave me the wherewithal to even be able to begin to realize the things i had in my head mm -hmm. You know, I, I find it simply amazing, and it speaks volumes about your character, is that out of all the people you've played with, the, the, the enormous names and enormous talent, that your most influential person goes back to being your sister. To me, that, that just says so much about what type of person you are and the character that you have. That's, it's, it's incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I, I've never, no one's ever asked me who's the one single most influential person, but, you know, it's like, I guess that was just the first thing that comes to my mind for, for good reason, you know? Sure. He's the one that lit the candle, you know? Now, yeah. didn't you have a solo uh, uh, single about her Cinnamon Girl back in 2017? Well, so, I, yeah, that's a, that's a B-side to my first solo deal single on Wicked Cool Records. Um, the A-side was called Here For You, and the B-side was Cinnamon Girl. And that's of course Neil Young's great song oh, okay. that he that he did on his first solo album after Buffalo Springfield. Well, I always thought that was like one of the coolest badass guitar riff songs, cool melody, everything about it. Yeah. I was young, I didn't care what the lyrics were about. I, I was like, listen to that guitar. Down 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 down. You know, I was like all about it. Yeah. Well, come to find out, you know, I was hanging out with Neil Young because he was friends with my sister. He was friends oh, with Jimmy wow. Jean. So wow. they'd be doing gigs at the Golden Bear or at the Ice House. Oh, and cool. here comes Neil Young. And he's in the dressing room hanging out. And this is before his solo career. This is like Buffalo Springfield. This is 66, 67. And I loved Buffalo Springfield, like crazy about them. And... So, well, flash forward years later, here comes Cinnamon Girl and, uh, and, and uh, Cowgirl in the Sand and stuff like that. And I'm going, wow, this is so cool. And Jean years later said, those songs were written about me. She said, Neil wrote those songs for me. Wow. Cinnamon Girl, Cowgirl wow. in the Sand and one other one. I, it escapes me right now. And so wow. as a kid, you know, your imagination is fired. You're like, what? Yeah. And so when uh, I was looking to do maybe a cool cover song for my B-side, I just chose that one because I felt like it's kind of, you know, almost like a heritage in my family, you know, to find that out many years later. Well, it turns out that they had a fling, uh, oh. Neil and my sister. And... Uh, there you go. I mean, cat's out of the bag 50 years ago. <laughs> what am I, what am I going to lie to you? It's what happened. Right. <laughs> you could. <laughs> so, 
So sp- yeah. speaking of guitars, man, Gibson guitar guitars honored you with a signature guitar. It's the uh, Brian Ray sixty three SG. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. How incredible, brother. That is crazy. I mean, you know, there's a billion <laughs> killer guitar players out there, and you know, I don't know how that happened, but they came to me and asked me if I had any ideas, and we came up with a cool idea, and there you go. It's, you know, it's a, a nice little thing, man. It's absolutely nice. So and we've that, got... That's a guitar I was playing in that shot you just showed with Paul, the, the black and... Oh, uh, really? And the white pick guard, yeah. Let's bring it up here. There it is. There it is. That's it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, it can be that a is prototype. a beautiful is, guitar. Is that a Bixby on there? It is a Bixby on there. Very okay. good eye. Good eye. Well, when I put nice. my glasses on. <laughs> 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 so let's talk about a couple other things we've got working here. So actually, I'm going to bring that back up just for a moment here. We're going to clip through here to a couple. Let's talk about this right here, brother. Ah, okay. All right. Well, before I embarked on a singles deal with um, Wicked Cool Records, uh, I was uh, writing songs for my two solo albums, Mono Magneto and This Way Up. Right. And my collaborator on a bunch of those songs was a guy named Oliver Lieber. Oliver is an old friend of mine. I've known him since the mid 90s or something like that. Just mutual admiration society. I knew him as a very big songwriter and producer in his own right. But he was also the son of Jerry Lieber, of Lieber and Stoller, who wrote yes. like Hound Dog yeah. and Jailhouse oh, Rock okay. and, you know, um, Yakety Yak, Under the right. Boardwalk. I mean, they're the guy. Wow. And uh, so it's obviously in Oliver's blood too. But uh, I came to Oliver after doing two solo albums, him being a big part of it. And I said to him, well, I'm ready to do a third solo album. Would you like to do some writing? And it was was over at his house. He goes, that sounds really fun, man, but I'd rather do a band instead. And I went, okay. And that was it. We decided (laughs) then and there, Sure. I mean, like, sounds fun. We had a great time writing. We always laughed our heads off. And I like what we used to write. So I said, sure. Then we went about defining, well, what is the bayonets? And how is that different than my solo stuff? So we came up with this idea. It's like, you know, like 50s, you know, like gangster movie, noir movie, stripper drums going on. And low guitars like Dwayne Eddy and a female and a male singing, you know, with some, uh, you know, relationship tension going on. And we just started banging away at writing new songs. And that's what we did. Yeah. That's cool. badass, brother. Badass. Thank All you. Right, so you got, uh, you've got a new release, a new single out right now too, don't you? I sure do. Yeah. That's just it. Dropped, right there. Just dropped on the 13th of this month or last month, actually. <laughs> Yeah, Friday the 13th. That's right. Yeah. An nice. auspicious day. So that song, uh, obviously, it's called Got a New Thing. And on the flip side is a song called Whiskey Train, which is a cover of a great old uh, Pro Call Harem song. Right. That I used to do in my high school band. Anyway, uh, the A side, Got a New Thing, <laughs> is a, a new original song that I wrote. And uh, I will flip back just to step back one couple of steps here after the bayonets that got played on little steven's underground garage quite a lot his radio station so uh little steven from springsteen's band and lillahammer and sopranos right has a, a record company and he's got a radio station it's serious and uh bayonets had gotten a ton of exposure he really liked the bayonets well, when the bayonets kind of wrapped up, we went on hiatus. Uh, I got a call from Steven saying, hey, would you be interested in a solos deal, solo singles deal? And I was like, yeah, I would. And just started writing away. Well, so here we are. This is my fifth single with him uh-huh. since uh-huh. 2017. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this is my fifth single. We're doing two singles a year. That's four songs a year. 
Cool. My latest one's called Got a New Thing. And I was thinking about, you know, I wanted to write a garagey rock song uh, with a big hook. And I started thinking about, well, what would I want to write about? And I thought about, you know, I've been seeing all these, uh, you know, hearing stories of female survivors of abuse. And then I saw this crazy documentary on a cult called the Nexium cult. And this guy named Keith Ranieri, who had duped all these people into believing he was like the seventh, seventh coming, right? He was like, weird dude. Anyway, he's in prison now. And I thought, how can I write a song that's really fun, but it celebrates the surviving people of, of abuse and coercion? And that's what it's about. You know, it's about surviving uh, occult or sexual abuse. Yeah. Now, we, I was lucky enough to get it the wave file a month ago. Oh, really? And got it, got it some airtime here on my stations with Jack FM and I'm telling you, brother, I, 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 I dig the vibe and so do many other people. So really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's absolutely. awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for playing it, man. I sure appreciate that. It's uh, I love making music, man. I love, uh, you know, arranging it and producing it and playing parts and writing it. And, you know, it's just, it's just the best thing. It's so fun. So when yeah. you hear back from people, we like that too. It makes you feel really good because yeah. you know, it ain't about the money. Uh, right. You're not making a lot of money when you're putting out singles. I mean, right. with the um, Wicked Cool Records and the Underground Garage, I do okay, to be honest with you. They do a, such a great job, but it's not like the old days when uh, you made millions and millions of dollars for a big single. Right. So I do it out of love for it and out of hearing from people like you saying that your listeners love it and that you love it. And that makes my day, man. I'm ready. You know, I'm ready to do it again. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Let's bring up your website real fast so people know where to find everything at that we're okay. talking about here. That's so we got brianray.com here. That's the and, place. Uh, man, you can you can go through this here. You've got all the music here, the Crash Boom Bang, the Bayonets. Uh, we've got the new single down here. And uh, it's actually a really cool website. I've enjoyed looking through it. And scrolling through it. So everybody can go there, www.brianray.com. And uh, you've got a shop on there. You got a store with all kinds of merchandise and and fun yeah. stuff. And and normally when we do this, the shops are really expensive. And yours is not. And I was impressed by that. <laughs> well, you know, again, this isn't about making a bunch of money, man. It's uh, about being fair and uh bringing people into the your world of music and hoping they stay and want to listen to some more you know it's not about taking people or you know anything else it's about you know community absolutely brother yeah. absolutely i know you said you had a session going on there and and you're kind of on a tight schedule so we'll we'll wrap this up a little bit but i, I gotta tell you i'm a fan i'm gonna continue to endorse you on any station that i'm on and keep playing those wave files that that your folks send us over. Thank you, Jody Best, so much for making this happen tonight. And Brian, I, I can't thank you enough. Oh man, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. It's great to meet you. Yeah, it's great meeting you. And uh, hello to all your uh, viewers and your fans and your listeners. And thank you for supporting uh, music, man. What can I yeah. say? We need it now more than ever. It's the one thing that we can all agree on and worldwide, it's the language of love. And it's the language of community, and we need more of it. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely, Fantastic. my brother. Much love and respect. Thanks again. Thanks, Brian. We really appreciate it. Really. Hope to, hope to see this you in great. the future. See you guys later. Bye bye. All right. Let's we'll see you. Cool. Wow. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say after that one, brother. Honestly. Yeah, it was cool. I like hearing the old stories of uh, the 70s, 60s, you know, uh, California scene. He was a part of that. He grew up in it, you know. Not many people can really tell you about it, right? Right. Very, very few. You know, Especially musically, the, 
the music scene and then just, you know, living here and just being the California, you know, just living it. I mean, wow, some incredible stories. Cinnamon Girl loves Cinnamon Girl. You know, what a great song and to go out. It was so it was your sister that inspired it. Right. With Neil Young. How crazy. You know, being somebody who didn't grow up in California and the and the mystique and the magicalness, you know, and the everything that surrounds California and, and you know, you, you watched the movies and you dreamed about how glamorous and how glorious California was to to hear somebody that actually got to experience that portion of California is just amazing. Yeah, it, it yeah. just it, it makes you in awe playing with Etta James and sharing the stage with the Stones and Sir Paul McCartney and just incredible, incredible talent. I can actually remember, dude, no kidding. I can remember that pregame with Paul McCartney in the 2002. Yeah, yeah. I remember it like yesterday and I remember him and seeing him on stage with him and, and to know that that's where it all began for him for the next 19 years. Yeah. That's incredible. One of my, one of my former students oh, is really, really into him and Rusty, uh, Evan Heyman. He might be out there watching. He sent me a text, oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> you get to hang with him. But he's <laughs> he's been into those guys for, you know, he's obviously a huge Beatles fan and he's uh, been into both Rusty and Brian's solo careers. So. It's kind of cool. I'm sure, uh, you know, music touches the world, right? It does, my brother. It does. Music is medicine all the time. So, yeah. so uh, we got some big things coming up still. We've got uh, we've got some shows we're going to do. We're actually going to launch the uh, On the Cusp this week here on yeah. uh, Live. So I think we've got some bands picked out, I think. We do. We'll start we moving do. on some of these bands. We'll do, it'll be a quick show. Tonight's show is a quick show. I think you kind of got them off a little earlier than he anticipated. But that's Billy okay. said 50 minutes from 7.55. Oh, okay. So that that's was good. exactly right It was on. good. So we'll probably do, you know, some quick shows with On The Cusp, but we're going to have, uh, I don't know who we have yet, but there's somebody that's uh, quite a few people have been emailing, right? Yeah, we, we've got a ton of people lined up, so we'll get that started this week. I'm going to be fun. It's just going to kind of focus on people who maybe you don't get to hear on the radio or are or, or right there and need that little nudge or a little push. Yeah, and maybe you haven't had the opportunity to work with, you know, to be blessed to be born around, because a lot of it is being where you're at. I mean, you grow up in an area where you could just be around the whole scene so many people yep. around the country are not around that. They're, you know, you're in a little town somewhere and there's nobody there. And of course the music scene now is so different than it ever was. Right. So to try and help in a little way that we can to anybody who's trying to break through that is doing it, we certainly want to try and help a little bit if we can. Absolutely. Play their song on here, play, if they've got a video, play it and get, get a little bit of steam as long as it's not licensed or or uh, push away and we'll start trying to do it every week. And then, you know, when we finally get that move to Twitch um, and I'll have a better camera next week. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> this camera took a dump on me a while ago. Anyhow, so uh, we will um, keep going on this, the Hangout Live on Facebook, even when we're on Twitch TV um, with people on the cusp. Yeah, we'll keep Fans that on the cusp. <laughs> see here so a day yet for on the cusp well let's think about this what do we think thursday uh, Maybe thursday night yeah i mean i don't want to make it a regular night i want to make it just kind of loose so we could do it this thursday i mean we'll put it out there and let everybody know once we go okay we have somebody picked for this week we'll probably do thursday right Okay. And yeah, then let's we, just keep uh, it loose. We'll keep the time loose. We'll keep the uh we'll post we'll post out there when it what day. Hey, we're gonna do it this day, it's gonna be at this time, and let's do it. All right. So kind and of then, uh, drive by. Do you want to say thanks to Darren O'Brien? Yeah, what's like up, Darren? Darren, Sherry O'Brien. All right, Brad. big shout outs to our sponsors, obviously, Backbeat Music, Alexandra and Tadim. I, I heard that Alex is on. Hi, Alex um leroy butler's with us again tonight leroy what's happening my, my leroy i love leroy he's just too cool uh full spectrum cbd just visit them on full spectrum tx 
and uh, you can get their amazing product that is sitting like literally right there. Right there. It's right there. There's a lot of it too. I saw it earlier. Right? Yikes. CBD is the way of the future, my baby. Yeah, CBD. Yeah. I'm gonna be uh, venturing into that market myself. CBD. And with our boy, Sean Baxter. That's my dog right there. So, and then uh, Media Jaw, Jody Gentry and his team keeping us up to date. Go to our website, check it out, www.thehangout.live. And who do we got next week? Uh, you would have to ask me that, huh? I could tell you if you if you have to look it up. Go for it, tell me. Brian Wheat, right? No, Brian Wheat's the week after, see? No, at least next no, week. No, Brian Wheat is the 15th, bro. Oh, see, what so, do I know? Let me bring it up right here. Let's go. I'm going to type it in right here so people can see it. We'll, we'll screen share it. Why not, right? Shoot, I thought Brian Wheat was next week. I'm not a fast typer at all. I just noticed that. All oh, right, so, so I'm like, going to screen share. Today's the first. It is the first. Hey, that's what threw you off. All right, let's screen share. Here's our website. For those of you who have not seen it, so of course we had Brian Ray this evening. And his little his bio there and some of his fun stuff that he's got and our sponsors. But let's see what we got coming up here. Upcoming shows. Let's go to the eighth. We have Zach Bear. Zach Bear will be joining us next week. Nice. And then the week after, we've got Brian Wheat from Tesla. Sweet. See and you. the 22nd, we're going to do a Christmas special. Um, I have a good idea for it. And uh, Matt agrees. I just uh, talked to the guys and we'll see. So I won't put it out there yet. I'll put it out there next week. I think they'll all be up for it. Look at that guy right there. Who that? Going to our bios and who we are and, you know, whatever. It doesn't yeah. matter. But uh, yeah. go there, check it out www.thehangout.live and we'll make it happen. So we'll see you on Thursday night with uh, an edition of On the Cusp. On uh, the first edition. The, the first, first one. edition. First edition. I was glad to be back this week. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you could make it. Thanks we're for letting stuck me out in up. some tower somewhere on your back. Trying, to, I don't know. We're we're talking about it. Going, what is he in a tower? I go, I don't know. I guess he's climbing a tower. I don't really understand. I don't really know. That's his thing. Dude, if you see this fat ass climbing a tower, you know there's something really evil at the bottom of it. <laughs> Ain't happening, baby. So you're not climbing towers when you're at the tower. Oh God, no! I'm in the transmitter room working on all the equipment. Is what I'm okay. doing. Okay. If I climb three steps up the tower, I have a cardiac arrest. And pass I tell out. you what, we went about two weeks ago to a, a birthday party for Ella or this, and this little girl, and they had this thing where you go up and and you have to climb up, and you go up to like 70 feet and you do a zip line down. But it, I mean, I was up there and they're like, "Okay, how you doing up there?" I go, "Never again." Never <laughs> climb up a net and then you get up on this thing and they've got you hooked in and you got to re-hook yourself every every little thing and they have a different obstacle course. I'm oh, going, no. oh no. I go, I hate heights. And yeah. then I finally got to the top and it's 70 feet up there and I'm sitting on the pole and I'm going, and each time somebody would go, the poles would all go, whoa. And I'm sitting on the edge and I'm going, oh God, am I ready for it? He goes, yeah, you're ready. I go, oh, and I'm like three or four times going, okay, just do it. <laughs> I mean, it was like scary. And there was a little girl, I had Ella in front of me and she was fine. And there was a little girl behind me who was scared out of her mind. So I'm trying to help her. And, she, and that helped me not maybe be as scared helping her. And then she got halfway and then she was stuck and they had to come up and get her down. And she was crying and couldn't do it. I mean, it's scary. So if you're going up on poles and doing that or towers, which you're not, it's good. But as I was telling everybody last week, you're the only one who knows how to fix the towers when stuff goes down. So he's the guy. Yeah, and unfortunately, that is part of my job. And then our engineer being in West Texas, our engineer is in Virginia. So guess who's the engineer? I don't know. <laughs> Me. So yeah, it's uh, sometimes it, it works out that way. And I got to do a quick shout out to Morgan Miles. Hey, say hey. To, hey, Morgan. Hey, Morgan yeah, Miles. So I wish you were going to be out here, brother, on December 12th. Morgan's actually going to come out to San Angelo, Texas. Oh, really? Um, and she is doing something, what's it called? Miles of, of Gratitude, um, where she is traveling around small towns throughout Texas, uh, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and just setting up in a van, dude, literally with a PA system and a wireless. 
and singing at places like VA hospitals and um, women's shelters and children's hospitals and cancer. And, and she's doing all this for free. And she's just doing it to promote. That's a working musician there. That's a working, so that's somebody who wants it. So for people who are trying to do it, trying to make it, that's what it takes. You got to yeah. go out and you got to work. You got to put it out all on the line. I mean, that's that there's there's a different level. There's a lot of people who are like, yeah, they want to do it. But when it comes down to doing it, they don't do it. That's doing it. And she that's called not me. easy. That's not easy. She, she called me. She's like, Drake, I got this crazy idea and I want to know if you can help me. And I'm like, I'm all in. Absolutely. So she's doing it basically for gas money and food money, man. And she's just going to go and, and spread some holiday cheer. And this is somebody who just got named as Nashville's um, Female Artist of the Year. So if she ain't no chintzy, you know, th this woman's got pipes and she's got some real talent and some, and some backing. So for her to do that, hats off to her, man. I love her to death and I can't wait for her to be out here on the that's, 12th. That's how you build it too. You know, it's, it's, it's all part of it. It's the passion. That's it's it. The passion. She's so, clearly got it. That clearly proves it. Catch an airplane, bro. Get your butt out here. You'll have yeah, to be part of it. I don't know about going anywhere. I think we're locked down for a while. Yeah, we're oh, I got to do a quick shout out to Brad Vanny's for his wine that he gave both of us for Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. right? Thank you, Brad. Absolutely. And I hope you're both better. So I think that's yeah. it. I think that is it. And we'll hopefully see you all on Thursday. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.